The first parable is in Matthew, as was stated, and that was a wedding feast. Jewish tradition in those days, and still to some extent right now, is that when you invite your guests to the wedding of your son, because that's where that culture went, you invited them, they knew who they were being invited, and you supplied new clothes. So they would come to the wedding dressed appropriately. I know, how many of you go to a wedding and dress in your work clothes and, you know, you just walked off the job and you're kind of dusty and not too many. New clothes. So the wedding feast in Matthew 22, the parable came after Jesus had a bit of a confrontation with the Jewish leaders and he had driven out from the temple area, the money changers. I don't know if you knew why that was, because you couldn't take your Roman money and put it in the offering plate. You had to get temple money. So you had to buy temple money from the money changers, then you could put the temple money in the offering plate. And that's what he was upset about, because they were cheating people on the money. So he drove them out. He was teaching the people, and then the leaders came up and confounded him, or tried to. Who do you pay taxes to? You pay taxes to Rome? He said, show me some money. They showed him a Roman coin. He says, this is where the give to Caesar, Caesar stuff, and to God, God's stuff. And then he sat down and said, there was this wedding feast. And it was all prepared, and the guests were invited, and he sent his slaves, the master of the house, the king, as it were, tell them it's time, come on down, we have a wedding feast to go to, and they went out, and they got excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse why they could not come. The king was a little upset with this, so he says, you go out and get whoever you can find right now. So they did, and they couldn't find enough. He said, go again. And the mother people will destroy their city and they won't have to worry about it anymore. Go again, and this time bring in the evil and the good. I was like, the first time I read that, I went, evil and good said, okay this is the king's wedding feast he can command whatever he wants and his slaves went out again and rounded them up he says make them come evil and good just make them come fill my house and they did except there was this one guy who chose not to wear the brand new clothes to the wedding and the king was upset with that. He said, I gave you every chance. I gave you every chance. But tie him up and throw him out. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So I translate that as kicking and screaming. Out of the kingdom. I'm like, okay. The second parable, which is similar but not quite the same, was a great lord had a banquet plan, a great feast, and he invited lots of people again. And this parable was at a Pharisee's house for Sabbath dinner. I'm like, well, that's a different setting. So while they were all milling about and getting ready to sit down and have the feast, Jesus did notice a couple of things. But he did ask some questions. So, If you've got a son or an animal of yours that's fallen into a well, what are you going to do? Today is the Sabbath, after all. And they didn't dare answer him, because they knew the right answer. 
you take care of it. There was a man with a swelling part of his body. He said, so, what do you do about this guy on the Sabbath day? And he did not get an answer about that. So he healed him. And while the guests are all wandering around and they're, I don't know, you, what, what's, the, what's the place of honor? Where? Head table. But this is a bigger table than that, just a head table. So in Jewish tradition, honor was a big deal. So you, as the lord of the manor, so to speak, you had the most honor. And then everybody else you had invited had a level of honor. And it almost, I was talking to a pastor one time, and he said, you know, the funny thing about that is nobody could have 100% unless you were the only one there. So the honor was kind of shared. And these people were all trying to go, let me think, where's the best seat in the house? Close to the head table. And Jesus was like, probably not a good idea. What if you sit down with a guest, the, the master of the house says, uh, that's for somebody else. You need to go over here. He said, that's embarrassing, is it not? So the best thing for you to do, go sit over there now. Be asked to come forward. And then he said there was this king, or this great man who had this feast planned, banquet planned. It was a great... He told his servants, oh, slaves again, but go out and tell the invited guests, come on down. It's time, we're ready, let's go. And it seems that these guests, like the wedding feast, had, well, you know, I got this new six teams of oxen, I gotta drive this new tractor around my field, make sure it works. So I just got married, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take care of that issue right now. Well, I understand about wives, but you're invited to this feast and you knew it was coming. And after all, they all gave excuses. And so the master of the house says, all right, go out in the streets and gather people up from my house. And we'll get it filled up. The servant went out, came back, said, this is all I got. I, there's, there's still room. He said, all right. I want you to go out to the gates, outside in the streets, outside of the city, hedges, wherever you can find them, you Get them and bring them here. He didn't say only the willing. He said, get them and bring them. The various languages I'm familiar with, I looked up those passages and said, all right. It says, compel them in the English frequently, depending on what translation. It says, and Russian says, make them come. German says, make them come. French says, oh, constrain them to come in. Is that a little less than make them come? I'm not sure, because in one of the translations of that is make them come. Make them come to my banquet. And they filled the house. What's the point of those two parables? Wedding feast, you come, you wear the clothes, it'll be a great time. Except that one guy who got thrown out because he wouldn't wear the clothes. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Kicking and screaming. When he said, find them and drag them out of the hedges and the highways and wherever you can find them, what kind of people were those, that last group of people? The other people were evil and good, last group. This one was the maim, the halt, the amputees, the sick, the ind and you get them and you find them and you bring them here who will fill my house. I see empty seats in this house. Empty seats are not acceptable to our Creator. Jesus was talking about himself when he was talking about the wedding feast of the and the son because who is he? Hasn't he promised 
There will be a supper in heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb. The second parable is very similar. The same, what's the moral of the story kind of thing? So you and I are servants to that king and to that master. How do we do that? Make them come. Now, the positive part of kicking and screaming, when I was six, my brother was three. As he's running up the steps in our older house, he stubbed his toe on one of the risers, which was a little bit splintery. Under the big toe of his right foot went a splinter. We figured out something was badly wrong because there was some screaming I don't know about the kicking at that point. But I went to see what was going on. My mom went to see what was going on. And, and I just kind of hung back because I could see already there's a problem here. And I don't want to be part of that. So my mom got my brother in her arms and sat down in the kitchen. And I think I might have been sent off to gather some stuff. I don't remember. How many people remember... Mercurochrome or methylate or anything. Yeah. How's that feel? And you got a splinter. How do you get a splinter out anyway? Yeah, so I got tweezers, there's gauze, there's bandages, there's methylate, and there's me going, oh, I am so glad that's not me. Because he was now starting to thrash a little bit. The kicking part comes in. There was still noise. And the louder I got, the more I was glad I was not me. So my mom went to work, cleaning the blood up so she could see what was going on. And my brother is still not a happy camper. I don't know if he wanted to escape, but he didn't try. I mean, she was holding him firmly. Don't get me wrong. There's a little coercion here just to be sure your patient doesn't run off. And she finally got that thing out and they're still yelling and hollering and less kicking, but the possibility was there just in case she stubbed it on something again and I just kind of backed off. But oh, what a relief. This is what I'm hoping for. Pain-free. Not there yet, but it's begun. The kicking and screaming into freedom from pain. Because I still come back to that compulsion, that compelling. How many of you have been compelled to do something that you didn't want to do, but you knew it ought to be done? Oh, yeah. I see a lot of hands going, eh, I've been there, done that. How many of you ever been in the military? Ever been ordered to do something you did not want to do? Did it anyway, didn't you? My experience was 24 years in the service, Air Force in particular, and there were missions that we did not want to go on. I was stationed in Alaska, and that was when that Korean airliner was shot down. And we all knew they thought it was us. Some of you might remember that it's a 747, but a 747 and a 707 look exactly alike from the gun position. Thank God the RC was not flying that day, otherwise they would have killed us. It's sad they killed who they killed. But that was the next missions going out after that were like, nobody really wanted to go on those because the Russians had already proved they're ready to kill you. Soldiers know this. 
Roger came out first. I joked about him being on point. The point man on a patrol is the enemy's first target. Scary days. And Christians have scary days. But Paul said, put on the whole armor of God. Well, right now I just got my sword, but it's there. When you and I are commanded by our commander to go and get people, what are we supposed to be doing? Go get them. The invited guests are kind of us, sort of kind of. You're invited to this feast. Don't make excuses. Go. Because even if there's no room in the master's house, because they're not everybody. What was that first text? Many are called, but... Somebody will refuse to go. The master will send you to go get some more. Fill my house. Pick them evil, pick them good, but bring them. Make them come. But there will be that few who will go kicking and screaming out. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. So the people in the byways and hedges... Were they running away? Were they hiding from the world, from God? And we're supposed to find them and bring them anyway. I talked to a pastor friend of mine, and I said, What's this compulsion thing? I thought God didn't force. He said, You still have the power of choice, but there's a certain level of physical... Let me demonstrate. I want to pick on my singer, because I like his song. Hi, come on. Where are we going? To the feast. What feast? Well, the great man of the house up there wants you in his house. And he told me to come get you, so that's what I'm doing. Thanks. How do you feel about confronting somebody who's maybe not so sure they want to go? I mean, they don't know God? What, or what have they heard? God's going to get you for this. You ever heard that phrase? Yeah, he's going to get you for this. But he's going to forgive you and bring you. And that's our job, is it not? Find them. Make an introduction. Urge them. Compel them, if you will. I don't know how to do that for sure. But it's supposed to be what we do. There's a little bit of force involved in compulsion. We each have things we do because we are compelled internally. How many people want to go pull splinters out of somebody's bloody toe? So my mom had her own compulsion, did she not? I'm pretty sure she didn't want to do this because there was going to be screaming and kicking. But she did it anyway. My brother endured it anyway. And they were both glad they did. I'm pretty sure, my mind's eye, Lamont, come here. I'm going to pick on you now. You're going to stand in the place of Jesus for me. Uh, really? Yep. Get behind me. At judgment, what happens? We are going to face the judgment seat of God. Do you have an advocate? I'm looking around in my mind's eye and go, Jesus is in our place. God is going to look at him and accept me because this is where I am. Because I don't want to face judgment all by my lonesome. But Jesus has ordered us to bring people to his feast. His wedding party. His great banquet. And he doesn't care a lot how we get there as long as we do. Name a great Christian pillar of the church that you can think of. And you think they're just wandering off into the kingdom, right? Maybe. 
Maybe they have been compelled. Maybe they have been constrained. And they've learned a lot and go, yes, this is where I want to be after all. You get to a big banquet, you didn't have to pay for it, somebody else did. And you're going to enjoy this banquet for the rest of eternity. And that, my friends, is the question we need to ask ourselves. Where am I? Am I being compelled? Am I being drawn? Am somebody grabbing me by the hand and dragging me to the kingdom? Because there are people out there who are hiding from God. Bring them. Find them. Give them the opportunity to come to the kingdom, to the banquet, to the wedding feast. Because my commander told me to. I might not be a great idea for me to go cold call. My singer I was safe with because he already sang that one, so I knew where he wants to be. Lamont, I've heard him talk. How many of y'all feel particularly perfect today, though? I don't either. Where are you? Father, thank you for the messages of redemption and how badly you want us that you will come get us. Evil and righteous, hiding and found. In Jesus' name we ask and thank you for these things. Amen.